But what are you mad about, Janet? The Chinese have developed a, a global supply chain that's just too big and we can't compete. Well, no kidding. That's what happens when you spend seven to ten trillion dollars building connectivity with the global economy instead of spending trillions of dollars blowing up the Middle East. One of the more interesting things of this uh, friendship that I've developed in Russia um, is that uh, the, my, my good friend Alexander Zirianov, he, he does a lot of business in China. And it's always fascinating to hear him talk about China through his eyes uh, because it's a learning experience for him. And there were Russian prejudices built in about China when he started and, and to work, watch him work through those. Prejudices. And some other people, too, that I've that I've met who are now because of the West's behavior, Russia has pivoted to China. Very, and just listen to them talk about discovering China. And, you know, it's amazing that, you know, they 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 are seeing the reality of China, something that the American people will never understand. I don't know how many times it's the same. I'll, I'll give you two things. One about Russia and Africa. I mean, it doesn't matter what the reality is. All I hear as soon as I say Russia and Africa, Wagner's in Mali committing war crimes. But Russia's in Wagner's in Mali committing war crimes. But they're not. Wagner's in Mali committing war. That's all they can say. That's all the programs say. Belt and Roads Initiative. They're going in and they're stealing the port from Sri Lanka. They went in there and they undercut Sri Lankan economy and they're stealing the port and nobody wants Belts and Roads Initiative anymore because the Chinese just steal everything. But that's not what happened. Yes, it is. How do you know? Because Mr. Cha told me on CNN. <laughs> oh, you're a genius. The whole point is, even when they do bother learning about Belts and Roads, they're, they're limited by what they access. And I'm talking about some very smart people. I put in my worst dumb American accent when I did that. But we can, why don't we change it to some very smart? I mean, because, you know, Americans, we are some of the dumbest people on the planet. But we immediately, if we assume, we hear somebody with a British accent, we assume intelligence. So we can just change it. Well, I say, <laughs> the Chinese have gone into Sri Lanka and they've done a rather bloody business there. They've undercut the, uh, the Sri Lankan economy. Oh, my God, it's a British accent. Genius! The dude is a genius. Yes, it's bad. <laughs> you know, so that's why we read the Economist and we read the Financial Times because it puts a British accent on this, and we go, "Then damn Brits are so smart. They know everything. They know nothing. That's why their economy is flailing. That's why a pathetic middle-sized nation that's in collapse. That's why they have no, uh, you know, influence in the world beyond what they what what they hold on to because of empire. But no, the Chinese are running. Carla, what is it, seven to ten trillion dollars that the Belts and Roads Initiative has put in to the global economy uh, since 2013? I mean, it's a ridiculous number, a ridiculous number. And it's created. You saw Janet Yellen again. I'm not the expert, but Janet Yellen just came back. The confusion in her face when she was talking about China because she wanted to get really mad at them. But what are you mad about, Janet? The Chinese have developed a, a global supply chain that's just too big. And we can't compete. Well, no kidding. That's what happens when you spend seven to ten trillion dollars building connectivity with the global economy instead of spending trillions of dollars blowing up the Middle East, you stupid woman. I mean, my God, if the Americans would take the Chinese approach, I mean, I feel bad for the Chinese now because they're building aircraft carriers. Don't. Don't. You don't need them. They don't work. You guys know because you've built missiles to sink our aircraft carriers. We have missiles that sink yours. Stop building aircraft carriers. Continue to do the Belts and Roads Initiative. You're winning. But no, the Chinese, somebody has convinced them that they have to have a blue water Navy that can stand up to the Americans. It's a bad business model, guys. It doesn't work. Just look at America. But, um, but the Belts and Roads Initiative works like a champ. And um, it's been dominating. There, the, there's things that just, the great downfall. There it is. The debt trap diplomacy. The wheels are coming off. I mean, my God, if you listen to them, uh, the, China's about to collapse because it, but, I mean, but look at the expansion of that. That map proves that Belts and Roads is too big to fail. There's nothing that can compete with it. Now, have the Chinese made mistakes? They will be the first to tell you they've made mistakes. They'll be the first to tell you that they went in and some of the deals that they cut. You know what China does that nobody else does? And correct me on this again, Carl, if I'm wrong. But they go in and they actually renegotiate deals 
uh, so that mm -hmm. um, they don't make as much money so that they reduce some of the problem because they realize, oops, uh, they can't pay it back. China's gone in and forgiven billions and done things. Why? Because they want to continue the business relationship because it's not about ripping off this nation. It's about making sure that this nation, this port is plugged into a system. So the Chinese will you know, reduce profits or eliminate profits here to make the entire enterprise profitable. The Chinese know that if they get, a, you know, if they, if the accusations stick here, other people will not want to be part of it. So the Chinese make it work for everybody. Um, we don't. This is why there is no Western equivalent of belts and roads, because every way we come in, we have interests. I mean, I don't want to pick on it, but you know, you want us to build that port? Yes, sir. We'd like you to build that port. Great. Uh, how's your transgender policy? What? Well, no, we, well, we can't build the port unless you uh, have a transgender policy. But we were talking about ports. Yes, we're talking transgendered now. See, America brings in social values. We come in and we insist that, you know, you have to do everything we want to change, fundamentally change who you are. The Chinese don't give a damn who you are. The Chinese just want to build a port so they can bring in ships, offload uh, goods that you buy. That's business. So, you know, we're... And I, I know I'm oversimplifying it, but the, the Chinese approach is a much more straightforward business approach than the uh, than the American approach. And it's working. The Belts and Roads Initiative is everywhere, and we don't know it. We don't understand it. I don't think the Biden administration could get away with it, or Congress could get away with their anti-Chinese statements if the American public was actually educated about the truth about China. Um, I mean, first of all, let me just put it this way. If we knew the truth... Stop persecuting trannies, Scott. Hey, Red Herring, I'm not persecuting them. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. It's not about me making this an issue. America makes it an issue everywhere we go. And um, there's reason why some nations don't want to do business with us because of the way we come in and try to socially rework their traditional family values. Ask the Republic of Georgia why they don't like half of what America is doing in there. It comes down to traditional values and America trying to impose an American mechanism. The Chinese just want to do business. That's what, that's what I believe. But the, the truth is though, is if we actually knew the truth about the Belts and Roads Initiative, it would scare us even more because the Chinese are doing it so good, so well, we can't compete. And that's the reality of it, that we, we are at a point right now where I think we're so far behind the, uh, the, the, the competition curve that, um, it doesn't matter how much money we put in, we, we, we can't compete, which means that for us to succeed, we're going to have to learn how to grab the coattails of belts and roads. Um, you know, we, we continue to operate that we can beat them at this game. I think the day of beating belts and roads is over. What we need to do is become a part of the belts and roads and see how much we can benefit from that. Um, Look at the, again, Carl, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, the whole idea of the India Middle East Economic Corridor that Biden was uh, promoting there for a while before Israel imploded um, was, you know, a competition to Belts and Roads Initiative, right? I mean, that, that's what he said. This is a competing with the Chinese. Does, does China have any um, input at all into um, Mumbai? I'm sure if we dug around Mumbai, we'd find that there was Chinese investment. But let's say the Indians have total control of the Mumbai port. Um, they don't have total control of Gwadar. You just pointed that out. That's a that's a big uh, port, uh, Pakistan putting on there. But this is the India Middle East Economic Corridor. Okay, so they they send their ships over and they get off at Dubai. Is there any Chinese connectivity to Dubai? I think there yes. is. And then when yes. they when, when they come out of the Chinese controlled port in Dubai, and how did that Chinese controlled port come to be? Belts and roads. Oh yeah. And then they, they they're going to put it on the train because they're talking about this train connectivity from the United Arab Emirates through Saudi Arabia, through Jordan, into Israel. But when you in, link up with the UAE train system, what's the primary contractor for the UAE train? China. You link in with the Saudi, who's the primary contractor for the Chinese rail? China. Belts and roads. Uh, then you get you work your way through Jordan. I don't know anything about China and Jordan right now, but let's say they build a train there. I'd imagine that China, since they dominate the train market, would dominate the Jordanian train market. It goes into Israel to the port of Haifa. Didn't China just spend billions of dollars upgrading the Haifa port so it can have this kind of throughput? So that's belts and roads. Now they put it on ships and they take it to Greece. And that port they were going to go in Greece, that is the 
the, the poster child of Belt and Roads Initiative in Europe. So basically, Joe Biden, to defeat, to compete against the Chinese Belt and Roads Initiative, plugged into the Belt and Roads Initiative. At least be honest about it, Joe. The Chinese beat you. And that's how we have to do it. We have to stop talking about competing with the Chinese and start talking about working with the Chinese. Um, and maybe at some point in time, you know, that we can turn the cur cur curve and, and, and say, hey, we're, now we can start, you know, having some input into this, you know, because the Chinese are businessmen. If you get a junior partner and the junior partner comes in and starts doing things really good, you're like, hey, junior partner, you're not senior partner. You got I'm bringing it up to the top floor. You got the big desk. You can sit around the me. That's how America could come in. Just be good at doing what we do. But we're not good. All we can do is war. And then we bully people in. And as a result, the Chinese have convinced the rest of the world that the, the Belts and Roads Initiative is the is the best way forward. And again, this is going to plug into BRICS. If people don't understand what's about to happen in BRICS, I'll bring up a game, Game of Thrones. They watch that in China. They, they see Game of Thrones, that series. All right. That great series. I loved it. Final season, Jamie Lannister. They're, they're, they, they just took over High, High Garden and they're bringing the gold back to pay off the, 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 the bankers, the iron, the iron bank. They're going to pay them off with all the gold. And old Daenerys is really pissed off because she got fooled around. So she and the Dothraki and the dragon are coming. And there's a scene there where you got all the Lannister guys lined up and here come the Dothraki and the dragon and the, the Sir Blackwater turns to Jamie and goes, they're getting ready to swamp us. Get out of here. And that's what bricks. The West right now is the Lannister army sitting there thinking they got this under control. They're sitting there, you know, shields and spears. <laughs> we got this guy. And they're sitting there looking at it. And here's coming bricks, the Dothraki. And China is the dragon. And it's over. They're going to swamp you. That's what's happening in October. And the world doesn't understand that yet. We're still thinking that we're going to beat them, that we can hold this back. It's over. They're going to swamp us. Now, the best bet right now is that we don't want to end up like those guys, remember, that were told to bend the knee or the dragon's going to burn you. We don't want to be that. What we need to do right now is say, China, whoa, stop. We don't need to fight. We can work together, join forces, do something. But we don't need to be swamped by bricks. But that's not how we operate. We don't know how to operate from an inferior position, but we are an inferior economy right now. Um, see, see, Scott, it doesn't have to be that way because uh, U.S. actually did le is leading in certain areas. For example, semiconductors. You know, China was importing uh, like 400, 450 billion dollars worth of semiconductors. You know, China mm -hmm. spent more uh, import on importing <laughs> semiconductors than China spent on importing oil, and a lot of the you know in, semiconductor technology or either originate or come from 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 the United States, and and ev as the China because China is a factory of the world, it produces everything. So, yeah. <laughs> but semiconductors is in everything. It's in refrigerators. It's in it's in uh. Uh, is in cell phones, is in, uh, in laptops. So as China Chinese economy was growing, the Chinese dependency on semiconductors was growing. So the Chinese dependency on United States was actually growing before Biden slapped on the sanctions, the semiconductor sanction on China. So and then like, what happened? And then what then, happened? Then, then China <laughs> is forced to Dude. develop their own semiconductor capability because like, before China was perfectly happy to buy from the United States, Huawei was perfectly happy to buy Qualcomm chips um, as other Chinese companies. But but U U.S. is saying no, no, sorry, Qualcomm, you can't sell to China. So, sorry, Nvidia, you cannot sell your AI chips to China. So so Huawei has no alternative but develop their own domestic suppliers. And, and but here's and, the thing: in the West, we have a model. You see, because I know how Western policymakers think. The Chinese, it's going to take them forever to catch up because the Western model is, you know, how would what would we do? How much would we have to invest? And it's prohibitive because we don't have a market sustainability. We have, you know, we get 300, 340 million Americans, you know, that's our market base. And so it's too expensive, prohibitively expensive. The Chinese will be behind. The Chinese went, we got 1.4 billion people. Um, 
So we're just going to recruit the best and the brightest, and we're going to bring them together, and we're going to do a rapid thing. Um, am I right? You know, again, I'm not a semiconductor. I'm not an expert on just about anything, just so people know that. I'm honest about this. But my understanding is that one of the key aspects of this microchip business is there's lithography, um, a lithograph machine that comes from the Netherlands, I believe, is the place that produces it. And they had some of them in Taiwan, and they didn't want this technology transferring over to China, so they put a ban on that. And by doing that, you limit China's ability to make the really fine stuff that prevents them from getting into, and there's a certain designation of the chip. And we said, we're going to deny this chip. China will be stuck here forever. And I think in less than a year, the Chinese have not only developed this lithography technology, They've surpassed it, and they're producing chips. I don't know if they're mass producing them yet, but they have produced conceptual chips that are better than the chips that needed. So the concept that we were going to disrupt China from transition into, I mean, uh, I know that uh, Alex was talking about 6G technology, but the Chinese are already in the 7G, I think. They're, they're, They're fooling around with this stuff. All we did is accelerate China's own internal development to now not only are are they not dependent upon Western technology. They've surpassed us and they're moving forward and we just made it easier for them. And this is my point on this is the same thing I said about the financial system. The Chinese don't want to unplug from the dollar. They don't want to do all this because they're happy with this balance. They're happy. The Chinese are all about balance, balance, balance is necessary. Life is about balance. The Chinese, I was going to say yin and yang. That is a Chinese thing. I hope I'm not going to, uh, throw a Japanese philosophy at the the yin and the yang, the balance. You know, it's all about balance. They don't want to rip you off. They want balance. They want harmony. And so there was a harmonious relationship financially, a harmonious relationship in terms of the chips. And we screwed it up. And so now the Chinese, I don't know if they've totally conquered the chip problem, but they're well on their way to conquering the chip problem. They don't need the West anymore. The West opted out. And then so China's, you're going to win this one too. And they're going to do the same thing on the finances. I just have a feeling that all the hard decisions that people didn't want to make because it's not harmonious um, are going to have to be made in October in BRICS. Um, and at the end of that, the, the dollar, like the Dutch lithographic machine, will be a thing of the past because the Chinese will have developed something new. Well, that's what I'm saying, Scott. It doesn't have to be that way. You know, China, you could have been a win-win situation for both China and United States to grow together. Uh, but the U.S. government, by its own decisions, it's, it's all the problem with the U.S. empire today, almost like 90% of it is self-inflicted problems. It's not because China, not because of Russia that's trying to sabotage the U.S. system. It's the self-inflicted uh, sanctions. You know, we, we slapped a sanction on Russia to force them out of the dollar system. We we are slap, slapped on the chip sanction on China to force them to develop indigenous chip manufacturing capabilities. It, it didn't have to be this way. I mean, there's no reason why uh, the earth is big enough for United States, Russia, and China. But somehow in people in Washington, they they think it's, it has to be a zero-sum game. It's, it's like it's everything for me and none for you. And, and you know, I, I can only get ahead if, if you know, you lose. And, and, and so I, I don't, I like, Putin was right when during his uh, interview with Tucker Carlson, he said, unless the U.S. ruling elite get rid of this kind of um, supremacy uh, mentality, the mentality that U.S., the hegemonic mentality that U.S. has to be number one, has to be the, the, the world hegemon, nothing is going to change. It doesn't matter who is going to be the president, uh, you know, whether Biden or Trump. It's, you, you're going to come up with the same you know, policy, if not shittier, you know, but Trump is the one who started all these China sanctions. Biden came out and just made it worse. And then, and so, I mean, like, it's, it's almost like I, 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 I have U.S. passport, you know, I'm a Chinese American. So I actually, it's my, in my vested interest to see China and U.S. get along, work together. And, and, but in the last eight, 10 years, I mean, I have been very disappointed in the direction the the U.S. government is going, and and it's it's and it, it, it's it, and it's 
it's it's getting worse. It's getting worse. But um, maybe I can ask you why 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 do you think the the, the leading Washington is leading us down that path? I mean, like, can they see that that? No, Can they just leave things alone? Like, why do they have to make it worse? Like, what? At the, at the beginning, the at the beginning of the show, we talked about the um, the the supplemental funding package that was just voted on, <clears throat> and I, I went through my reasoning why this had nothing to do with real national security policy or foreign policy, and everything to do with domestic um, American political uh, issues. Um, it's the same with China. You know, yes, we have some businessmen. Uh, first of all, most American businessmen, if they're realistic, you know, we're, we're willing to do business in China. I mean, a lot of people are doing business in China. When you're talking about, I, my brother-in-law produced, um, he, he produced small rubber parts. I mean, for everybody who opens up their, uh, you know, their, 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 their cabinet, their, you know, their clothing drawer, you know, those little washers that make the drawer come out nicely. He makes those. He makes all the little rubber parts that make life worth living. Um, and, you know, they do dye mold, produce, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, he was looking at a business model here in the United States. And it, it came down to if he opened up, you know, a business in China that did this, uh, the scale, the, you know, the, the, price, the cost of everything, suddenly what was a marginal business became immensely profitable. And the, you know, the potential to move it. There were some downsides. I mean, he had a niche business with American defense industry. So if you're making parts for, you know, something, um, it, you can't make those parts in China. You know, it's it, that, you know, it's the whole way. So you, 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 you keep up now what allowed that niche industry to continue was the profits that were being made in China. Uh, and so, you know, we were, we, we, American business was, was getting on with China. We were exploiting, um, you know, the scope and scale of the Chinese economy. Uh, businessmen weren't unhappy. Politicians are unhappy. Uh, that's the problem. You see, in America, we need to stoke fear amongst the American population to do things that keep the existing political and economic elite in power. And Again, going back to Eisenhower, the military industrial congressional complex, we need a state of perpetual conflict in the world to justify the kind of uh, disproportional emphasis we place on defense spending and things of that nature. We need an enemy. We need a threat. And it has to be regional in nature. So even though we have a nice, convenient threat in Russia, the thing is we need a threat in the Pacific. And so China has become that threat. It's the perpetual threat. Now, our solution for Russia and China was to get them to basically yield to us, bend the knee, and become subservient to us. That's what we tried to do with Russia in the 1990s. And believe it or not, that's what we were trying to do with China in the 1980s and 90s. Um, the whole idea of introducing capitalism to China was to bring about the end of the Chinese Communist Party. And... Um, and get China to become subservient to us, that big Chinese market would be linked to the American industrial machine. We'd be exploiting that. But the Chinese did it better, just like the Russians had Putin come out and say, we're not going to do that. So now, we, we instead of learning to live in peace and harmony with equals, we don't know how to live with equals. We need to uh, turn them into the enemy. And this is the reality of China right now. China will forever be our enemy because we have to have a Chinese enemy. If we don't have a Chinese enemy, how do we explain our politics in the Pacific? How do we explain our policies? And so our, our politicians, they're not about determining what the truth is about China. They are about sustaining the fiction about China. They are about exploiting the existing prejudices built into the American um, you know, nation, the American people about China, just the same way we do with Russia. The, the Russophobia is matched by the Sinophobia that exists in America today. And this is what our politicians are about. They're not, when was the last time we had a Senate hearing that tried to tell the truth about China? Um, you know, when was the last time we said, let's, you know, let's bring in real genuine Chinese experts? No, when we have Senate hearings, we bring in the Cha's and the, you know, Juan's and the, 
all these haters out there who you know publish papers about how bad the Chinese Communist Party is. Look, even Tucker Carlson, who you know many mm -hmm. well, appreciate for what he's done with uh, you know trying to expose the lies about Russia on China, he's a total closed mind. Um, others are too. I got in trouble the other day about John Mearsheimer. I, I don't know if it was on this show or something else. Um, I, I, I accused John Mearsheimer. I said maybe he needs to go to China, and apparently he goes to China a lot. And he, uh, he and he interacts with Chinese a lot. So I stand corrected on that. But just because you go to China and interact with China doesn't necessarily mean you're getting it right on China uh, because you still have the prejudices that, that go in. You know, the bottom line is I'm not saying China's perfect. I'm not saying that um, that it's an easy path to um, Chinese-American improved relations. I think actually it will be a very long and rocky road. We've got a lot of things we got to overcome on both sides. But it's a path that's doable. Uh, if we would just sit down and start talking to people realistically about the real problems that we face, how can we overcome this? Um, but you can't do that if you're, you know, I'll just leave it at this. It's something I say all the time. You can't solve a problem that you haven't properly defined. If we're not going to sit there and be honest about what the Chinese problem is uh, and say this is the problem, um, whatever solution we come up with is solving nothing. That solution instead is nothing more than political cover uh, to to allow us to pursue policies that are pleasing to the voter but doesn't solve any problems. And a prime example of that is TikTok. Total garbage policy, total garbage approach. Um, but, it, you know, we made it the law. We're going to try and ban TikTok. It doesn't make any sense. But Americans fear Russia, or fear China. We're told that TikTok is spying on everything we do. Um, you know, uh, the reason why I, I got a cold this morning is because of TikTok. TikTok gave me a cold. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we have to ban TikTok. But that's that's it. We, we're just dealing with an overwhelming level of ignorance in America today about China and the reality of China. And, and therefore, we're unable to come up with uh, solutions to this problem. Um, I, I want to bring something up. Uh, I just want to show you guys on the screen here. This is the current trading of the S&P 500. And I'm going somewhere with this. I'm um, not sure if this audience is aware that I am a derivative trader for over 20 years and been trading these financial instruments for two decades. I just want to give you a snapshot. Currently, right now, we see 4,985 handle on the S&P. And just mark that number for a moment there. That is the U.S. top 500 companies by market cap. Now, hold your hat on this one here. And we will go to another screen here. And this is actually um, my trading screen, my trading platform. You probably can't see it very clearly, but look at the insurance. These are derivatives on the S&P 500. When you see open interest of 1,138 contracts with a 50 multiplier, what that means is there are a lot of banks, financial institutions around the world, and we'll go right here and we'll click on that, that are putting insurance on the S&P, which is 74.6% off the market for December 13 to 1400 on the S&P. Alex, just a sec. W which stock should I short? No, it's not a fun shorting, oh. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> what I'm saying is in 20 years of trading, I have not personally seen that type of open interest on the market. And that right now uh, sends shockwaves to me, uh, seeing that if people are insuring the S&P 500 down at 1,300 points, that's a 70 74.6% drop all the way down here. You can see it 57% uh, off the market, 1,716 open contracts. These are mega, mega contracts and they're, it's big money. And the concern to me is, is I haven't seen this in many years. And this shows me that people are very concerned about November and it, that just resonates here again when I start to see these these contracts uh, and we're and I'm starting to get some people here. Yeah, that is the December put options there expecting some serious things to happen in December. 
Jonathan, you've hit it right on the on the nail there. What do I need to do to make money in December? Just give me the easiest. Do I need to buy stocks or sell stocks or what do I need to do? What's your strategy, man? No, I'm just saying, Scott, that you know when you when you're talking about instability or when you're talking about nations uh, paying attention to certain dates. People are really watching November, and from a geopolitical standpoint, this, whenever there's moves in the market, and we call it volatility, the best volatility index is the VIX. I don't know if ever, you know, I don't want to get into this too much. I don't want to bore people here, but uh, the volatility index on the United States is called the VIX. Uh, just how, it, let me just bring this up just to show you guys what I'm talking about. Uh, Scott, okay. if you want stock tips, Ask Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi is the <laughs> best stock picker in Congress. She's beat the market <laughs> reliably. So this is the um, this is the volatility index, the CBOE, and I'm just going to show you guys the five year graph on this thing. You guys can probably sense what that that what that is. Third of March, 2020. Okay, that's when the pandemic was hitting its peak. Yep. And and that's a 66 handle on the VIX. That means that's when the S&P fell almost 43% in, in a month there. Right now, we're seeing a small uptick in it. And to me, it's relatively all calm. But what triggers this is now I'm kind of concerned here where we have, you know, a lot of action going on in December. So that means that are we in for a surprise in November, November elections? I mean, what other news can we anticipate because in the option market in the derivatives market i've had this argument a thousand times the action always happens first in the derivatives market and then it falls into the stock market maybe we can uh, get some people in the in the chat here to maybe let us know give us your opinion uh and i'll let these gentlemen back to talk but uh, uh well, let us I've, know I've, I've got to run because i've got to take okay. my wife to a very important appointment. So um, I am her Uber. And unless you can give me a stock tip that allows <laughs> me to make enough money to buy a driver and a car, I got to get got it. it. <laughs> Scott, I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. You can say goodbye to Carl here and then uh, I'll end it up with Carl. We'll stick around for a few minutes. All right, Carl. Go Good ahead, talking Tom. to you, Carl. I apologize if I stepped on you. I was really hoping to uh, let you speak, but unfortunately, Alex no, pulled no, no. the string. And People in chats are telling me to shut up because they want to listen to you. So I'm, no, I'm following that advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good one. Thanks, Scott. We'll, we'll see you in a, you in a few weeks. Okay. Take care, okay. sir. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. Carl. Yeah. 